Sacri Srimad, Kisiva Inglese, Si Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Ki Dei, Iskon Samstapa Kacharya, Srila Prabhupada Ki Dei, Ananta Koti Vaishnava Vrinda Ki Dei, Nittai Gaur Premanandi, All Glories to the Assembled Devotees, All Glories to the Assembled Devotees, All Glories to the Assembled Devotees, All Glories to Shri Guru and Shri Gaur Yananjana Shalakaya, Chakshurum Militam Yena, Tasmai Shri Gurade Maha, Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha, Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha, Patitanam Pavanebhyo, Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha, Ananda Lilamaya Vigrahaya, Emapadivyakcha Visundaraya, Tasmai Mahaprema Rasa Pradaya, Chaitanya Chandraya Namo Namaha. Uh, first, I want to thank His Holiness Paramananda Swami Maharaj and His Grace Lasuka Prabhu for giving me this opportunity to share uh, my little study on uh, Sanyas in ISKCON. Uh, I got a PowerPoint presentation, but since we couldn't get a, a projector, I will use the, the, what the, the points I had prepared as an outline and we'll have discussion. The topic is history of sannyas in ISKCON and how this came about is that in relation to the service and, and in, in ISKCON education in Bhaktivedanta College in Radhadesh, I was doing a master's study in the study of religion. Uh, this was some years ago and I decided to to take the topic, a topic which will be relevant for my own education and which could serve as a contribution to ISKCON, to the devotees of ISKCON, and particularly to the Sanyas Ashram. So I chose the Sanyas Ashram in ISKCON and the, the, the context was, I was feeling bothered, there was something that bothered me, and was, how is it that such a high percentage of ISKCON sannyasis have given up the ashram? It bothered me for different reasons. One, one was, uh, first, I, I was a sannyas candidate at the time when I started the study, about five years ago. I finished my study after having taken sannyas. Uh, and what was bo bothering me is, okay, I don't want to end doing the same, but if so many senior devotees, they, they, they take the responsibility and later, later on they give up, it will be pretentious for me to, to say, okay, I don't have to worry about it, I'll be okay. If big, big, devo big devotees, they do that. We had a recent experience, something very much unexpected. So it will be pretentious for us, for those of us who are younger, to say, okay, no problem, I can make it, no, I'm okay. So this was the, the reasoning behind doing a study on it. And the study has two parts. One is the historical development of Sanyas, in order to understand it better. And here, what I'm going to present, I'm just sharing some results. This is a little research. It's not the history of Sanyas. It's some perspectives on the history of Sanyas from classical times, going through medieval times, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, and then what happened in ISKCON, some perspectives for reflection and discussion. I don't claim to have the answers. I'm just sharing some results for your consideration. 
and for discussion. So what I intend to do, it's a very broad topic. Uh, it's the, the, the full document is 20,000 words. It's not yet published to be presented for an ISCON audience. It's written as an academic paper. So some work needs to be done in order to be presented. Uh, but the, what we can cover here is just some, some aspects of it. And I'll try to cover what may be more relevant to you as and as candidates. So, okay, Sri Prabhupada started the Krishna Consciousness Movement, as we know, in, in 1965, and then founded officially, founded it in, officially in 1966. And very soon, he started to initiate sannyasis. The first sannyas initiation Sri Prabhupada gave was to uh, Kirtanananda Swami in 1967, just one year after he had legally established ISKCON, which clearly indicates that Sri Prabhupada had uh, as a strategy to uh, send Sanyasi preachers all over the world to spread and to maintain the Krishna consciousness movement. And Sri Prabhupada initiated all together, personally, he gave sannyas to 54 devotees, according to the records I received from the Ministry of Sannyas. I don't know if in the, in the early days, it may be that some information is, is lost, we don't know, but the, that these are the records. 54 sannyasis, uh, from which I don't want to create controversy, but this is data which is there, 40 gave up. From the 54 directly initiated by Srila Prabhupada, 40 gave up. Of course, they took sannyas very young. It's a very different situation. And we will discuss this during this session. Uh, so later on, in total, according to the records from the ministry, up to 2010, 194 sannyasis have been initiated uh, in ISKCON. This means for ISKCON sannyasis, uh, from which 87 now, okay, 2011 will be, I don't know how many last year, three, four, five, five last year, so that will make 199. Is con sannyasis, since Sri Prabhupada gave sannyas to Kirtananda in 1967. From, from this, from 199, 87 gave up, which, which indicates when we look at the history of sannyas, even though, of course, we are, we, we are older, we can say, we are more mature in age and experience, but we shouldn't take it for granted. This is something I'm, I'm getting for from the interviews I, I did to ISKCON sannyasis who are successful, who are doing very well as sannyasis. I interviewed 12 sannyasis, and they're doing well, they are preaching strong. And, and from several ex-sannyasis who shared their experiences of what influenced them to give up. So before getting into ISKCON proper, I decided to study, to look into sannyas, going back to the roots, to, to Shastra. What does Shastra say about sannyas? And what has been the historical developments of sannyas? Uh, what what is clear is that the sannyas, the way how we apply the sannyas principles in modern times, and the way how sannyasis will live in the classical times, even if externally different, are substantially different. And this is something that we should be aware of. 
The principles are the same, but how do we apply them? It varies. And I'm going to give some specific evidence of that. So, actually, the main reason why Srila Prabhupada gave sannyas, and Srila Bhaktisiddhanta established sannyas within the Chaitanya Sampradaya, was for preaching Krishna consciousness, for preaching pure devotional service, for preaching kaya mano vakya, body, mind, and words in the service of the Lord. And that's what Sri Prabhupada says, that's sannyas. Sannyas is service to Mukunda. Sannyas is not the title, he says in the purport to the Abhaldi Brahmana verse in Chaitanya Charitamrita. The sannyas is not the title nor the cloth, but yet we're using the title and the cloth. The problem is when we mistake the title and the cloth, for the real essence of sannyas, which is service to Mukunda. That's sannyas. And it is done formally only for preaching. If we go to classical times, of course, that's not to say that there will not be preaching, but the references we find in Shastra are more in terms of asceticism, very severe, uh, practices of renunciation. And I'll read some words. There are five, uh, we, can, we can divide, uh, I did I took from some scholars who studied the tradition, but I'm quite accurate, I think we can agree with them. Uh, this is a scholar, Patti Oliver, who studied the ancient traditions from the different Dharma Shastras. Uh, from Manu Samhita, from the Sanyas Upanishads, there are quite a number of uh, Upanishads with, which describe uh, the life of Sanyasis. Also looking into, into Puranic references and other Dharma Shastras, which are only, we have a few of the Dharma Shastras presently that we can directly read, looking into the Sanskrit, or looking at the translations for those of us who are not Sanskritists. Only five, five from the 20 Dharma Shastras, only a few of them are available, five or six. So this is called identify five, five characteristics of the sannyas lifestyle. One is cutting social ties relationship with family and so on. Another is an living an itinerant life without a fixed home. So I'll, moving to different places. Then uh, abandoning property, no property, and mendicancy to the point of especially with the issues of food, the rules are very severe. We don't follow that in ISKCON. The rules are very severe. I will read some quotes, from, both from Bhagavatam and from Manu Samhita. Then abandoning ritual activities also. Ritual activities, meaning even ritual. Connection, for example, uh, which, which uh, the sannyas in the Gita is also will question that point. But there's still many sampradayas, if we go to the Madhva sannyasis, I'm not sure about the Ramanujas. In South India, they don't even do achman with, uh, with uh, metal pots because they're made with fire. So connection with, with fire is very much uh, the orthodox Sanyasis will be very careful uh, with getting into, having any contact with it. And then, of course, uh, strict rules of celibacy in body, mind, and words. So just to show the difference between classical sanyas and present sanyas, uh, yes. Where's, 
What is the scripture against fire? Why do they avoid fire? From the uh, well, because usually the, the fire sacrifice was traditionally maintained by the hostas, by householders. And then sannyasis would not have, would not directly be involved. Traditionally, I'm talking about the classical times how it was according to Varnashram. According to Manu Samhita, sometimes we quote Manu Samhita, but man, according to Manu Samhita, those of us who took sannyas from Brahmachari could not take, could have to go through the four ashrams. According to Srimad Bhagavatam, we can do. Because Bhagavatam is a higher principle. But according to Manu Samhita, we cannot. So, anyway, that's the answer as far as, I, as far as I understand. The fire yagya was maintained by householders. So sannyasis will not have any connection with that. That's not according to Pancharatri, but according to Vedic, that will be the system. But what, what does that have to do with an ashram copy of the I mean, I don't know, but it's the, the orthodox. The Orthodox people, they follow that, they see a connection there. For me, it's not relevant. The reason why I'm mentioning this is to show the differences of what we do nowadays with what in classical times was done. And to put into context Sanyasi Niskon from historical perspective. That's the only reason why I'm mentioning that. A couple of quick words. Uh, regarding Manu Samhita, let him go to bed once a day. Let him not be eager to obtain a large quantity of alms. When no smoke extends from the kitchen, when the pestle lies motionless, when the embers have been extinguished, when the people have finished their meal, when the remnants in the dishes have been removed, let the ascetic always go to bed. Let him accept so much only as will sustain life. Let him not care about the quality of his utensils. By eating little and by standing and sitting in solitude, let him restrain his senses if they are attracted by sensual objects. By the restraint of his senses, by the destruction of love and hatred, and by the abstention from injuring creatures, he becomes fit for immortality. So this will be one quote, another similar quote from Bhagavatam 11, 18, 18. Uh, Rejecting those houses that are polluted and untouchable, one should approach without previous calculation, seven houses, and be satisfied with that which is obtained there by begging. According to necessity, we may approach each of the four occupational orders of society. So this will be the rule for Madhukari, which the, some of the Goswamis in Vrindavan, they follow. They will approach seven houses, not, will not be chosen, but will be random. And whatever is received, it will be accepted as Krishna's mercy. Uh, His Holiness Karamakana Maharaj, joking about that, he will say, we are Kuti Chak or Baudak in Iskon, because we take a full plate. According to the classical rules, we are forbidden to take full plate. I'm not advocating that, I'm just showing the Sanyasi Niskon is for preaching. It's a different type of applying the principles than in classical and medieval times. Uh, then, if we look at, let's move now from classical times, what Shasta says, we move to medieval times. And the medieval time is characterized, this is the period of the great Vaishnava Vedanta Acharyas, uh, Sri Madhva Acharya, Sri Ramanuja Acharya, 
So in Imbarca, actually, of course, then in, the Imbarca, they will say that in Imbarca, Charia, they will not agree that he lived in the medieval period. They say that he lived 5,000 years ago. But anyway, that's not the topic of discussion. But traditionally, he's classified in the medieval times. And then Vishnu Swami Acharya is prior to Shankaracharya. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur explains that uh, Vishnu Swami Acharya, he established a tradition of Vaishnava sannyasis prior to the Shankara sannyasis, uh, known as many of you will know as Dasha Namis, sannyasis with ten names. And in India, those of you who are from India know that still nowadays they, they have a reputation, they are the most reputed as sannyasis from the orthodox point of view, very influential in, in many places in India still. And the, the sannyasis, they did establish the, the math system we know, uh, sannyasis living together in monasteries. That's not to say that in classical times they may have not existed, we don't know, but we don't have a clear reference to that as much as we have during the medieval time. And in the medieval time, the sannyasi, the figure of the sannyasi becomes the spiritual master of the institution, of the mat. And, and becomes a preacher, and there are actually doctrinal uh, reasons why the Vaishnava Charyas took sannyas. And we find that that, uh, that was done in order to preach the message of Vaishnavism. In the case of uh, Sri Vishnu Swami, Vishnu Swami. He established, he initiated, according to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, 700 sannyasis, and they were preachers of the message of the Vaishnava Siddhanta. Uh, later on, Sri Palashankaracharya, he uh, established Advaita Sannyas and preached uh, Mayavad philosophy around India with great uh, success. And, and the Vaishnava Acharyas, later on, they took sannyas in order to refute Shankaracharya. And actually, uh, Ramanu Acharya, he was a Svatantra sannyas, he was self-ordained, self because they were, he didn't find at that time, Vaishnava sannyasis in order to, to initiate him. So, okay. He, would, he didn't take from Mayavadis, he, he self-ordained and then he preached uh, Vaishnava Vedanta or Advaita qualified monism. Yes, monism, but according to the conclusions of Bhagavad Gita and, uh, and other Shastras, Vishnu Purana, Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, and the medieval sannyas is that there is the, there are only a few records, but still we, ha we find some rules for sannyasis. There is a particular work entitled in, in Yati Dharma Samuchaya by Yadava Prakash. Yadava Prakash, those of you who are familiar with Sri Ramanuja Acharya's life, will remember that he had a Mayavadi guru who later on became his disciple. His name was Yadava Prakash. And Yadava Prakash, later on, he became a Vaishnava Sanyasi. Uh, he, he compiled a book, this book, of Dharma Shastra, a medieval Dharma Shastra for Ramanuja Vaishnava Sanyasis. And he draws a lot from the Dharma Shastras. And it may be good for, uh, for us to consider, we do need, some, in due course of time, a specific set of rules, very, very precise, for Iskun Sanyasis 
in modernity, in the present time. Because otherwise, it's very much subject to interpretation for each individual. How do we, go, how do we, we apply the principle? But anyway, that's another subject. <coughs> so the rules are also very, very strict, very similar to classical times, but with a degree of what, what some scholars have called domestication. Domestication means for, uh, integrating some of the uh, Brahmanical principles, Brahmanical principles, followed by Rihastas for sannyasis also. For example, in Yadava Prakash, in his Dharma Shastra, he says, he says that whatever rules are not there for sannyasis, one should follow the rules given for Brahmana Grihastas. So if nothing is written, we take the general rule. So, the, the rules are still, very, are, are still very strict for eating, are very strict rules in the eating process, which we don't follow, and, and are noticeable different from the rules Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu follow as a sannyasi. For example, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will accept four meals, which Ramanuja sannyasis, according to that book, if they will follow it, they will not accept a few hundred of years ago. Of course, he will accept full meals from Vaishnavas, Brahmana Vaishnavas, or even Shuddha Mahachana Vaishnavas, Vaishnavas born in Shuddha families, if they will chant the holy name, for example, Chaitanya Bhagavad says, if they are love party. So he was very strict in eating also, but more more accommodating than in the early medieval period. Uh, then, the, let me see if I miss any important point. Okay, then we go to Sri, Ch Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's sannyas. As we know, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas from the Dashanami line, which is somewhat even puzzling because there were Ramanuja sannyasis at the time, and he could have taken from them, but for some reason he chose to take sannyas from the, from the, the Shankara line. It seems to be that it was just practical, it seems to be one reason that Keshava Bharati of Katva was passing by Navadweep, so that was very practical. And it seems to be also that because the Shankar Sanyasis were very well established, he wanted to use their prestige to communicate the uh, Vaishnava Siddhanta, the message of pure devotional service. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu takes Sanyas to command authority to preach pure bhakti and refute mayavad. And then, of course, there are also internal reasons uh, that we find in some of the Goswami books, like there is a book by Lokanath Goswami, or a reference from Lokanath Goswami, where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu reveals uh, internal reasons for accepting sannyas in terms of uh, receiving the color of separation, the saffron color of separation, with, which was used by Srimati Radharani. This, this will be the internal aspects, which we will not go so much into them, because the primary emphasis of Srila Prabhupada and Srila Bhaktisiddhanta was for preaching. Sanyas is taken in our line for preaching. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's primary pur purposes for accepting sannyas is for preaching. The quotes, I will not read the quotes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepting sannyas for uh, uh, 
the sake of time, it's in Adi Lila, chapter 17. There are a series of verses which I don't have the exact reference, but if you search the Gopi, Gopi reference, the whole description is there. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu expresses how he takes and just to command respect and to attack them to devotional service. Maharaj. I was just reflecting on the fact that even although Srila Prabhupada more or less aligned the principles of this kind of Lord Chaitanya Sanyas, he did also adjust that also according to time. So he's, in certain cases he wasn't as strict as Lord Chaitanya, especially when a sannyasi somehow fell down. He was allowed to come back, take great and in the end to get service in that ashram. Which really was Lord Chaitanya more or less said if you fall from you, you know, suicide is the only thing. And Prabhupada's commented on that, and I'm not as strict as Lord Chaitanya. So we might actually say there's another aspect of Sanyas and that is how Prabhupada adjusted things. Yes. Yes, of course according to the Dharma Shastras, this Yati Dharma Samuchai from Yadava Prakash, uh, there are rules for atonement for different foul downs, they have what they call the creature. The creature is a very severe type of austerity. Mm -hmm. And for extreme foul downs, the only atonement is also suicide. So it's there also yeah. in, in other Dharma, Dharma Shastras for yeah. Sanyasis. Yeah. Prabhupada didn't want that. He, he rejected that idea completely, that that's not an option. Better just to come back and perform devotional service in another ashram. Yeah. yeah. Yes, but, but, of, but of course, as Maharaj, as you are pointing, pointing out, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu didn't want devotees to give up. So yeah. if we take, if we take, we should stick to it. Otherwise, yeah. oh, we shouldn't take. That's, that's our commitment. If we're taking, that's not, we shouldn't contemplate that as an option. And, and this is... That's not my point. Yeah. My point was just to show that there's another adjust for and that was Prabhupada. So, to incorporate Lord Chaitanya's principles according to Prabhupada's vision, I think, is where it's going. Mm. Yes, yes. Now we're coming historically to Iskon, and we will see Prabhupada's quotes on that view of them. Then, okay, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's spirit is reflected in the Big Gita's verse. Uh, I, I think you must be familiar, you must know the verse. Etamsa astai paratmanishtam adhyasitam purva tamayar mahatpi hamtarishyami duranta param tamomu kundamirin seva yaiva. I shall cross over the unsurmountable ocean of nations by being firmly fixed in the service of the lotus feet of Krishna. This was approved by the previous acharyas who were fixed in firm devotion to the Lord, Paramatma, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So this was Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's spirit and to go to Vrindavan, the inner mood of going in order to serve Krishna, going to Vrindavan to, to meet Krishna, to serve Krishna. Uh, then something interesting in our Sampradaya, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not continue a line of Vaishnava Sannyasis as like from the Dashanami line of Sannyas. So the, the system of, although there were disciples of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who were renouncers, they didn't accept the red cloth, as it is mentioned in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Rakta Vastra, the saffron or red cloth, as traditionally accepted. And we find the, the description of, uh, of this when, uh, it's a very short description. Uh, when Sri Sanatana Goswami, met 
ಜಗದಾನಂದ ಪಾಂಡೆ ವಾಸ್ ಸೆಂಡ್ ಬೈ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಮಹಾಪ್ರಭು ಟು ವೃಂದಾವನ್ ಟು ಅನೌನ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಹಿ ಇಂಟೆಂಡ್ ಟು ವಿಸಿಟ್ ಸನಾತನ್ ಗೋಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿಸಿಟ್ ವೃಂದಾವನ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಇನ್ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಸನಾತನ್ ಗೋಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ವೇ ಸೊ ದಟ್ ಸನಾತನ್ ಗೋಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವಿಲ್ ಅರೇಂಜ್ ಅ ಪೀಸ್ಫುಲ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಲೋರ್ಡ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟೇ ಸೊ ಜಗದಾನಂದ ಪ ಜಗದಾನಂದ ಪಾಂಡಿತ್ ವಿತ್ ಒನ್ ಲೇಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಾಸ್ ಸ್ಟೇಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಸನಾತನ್ ಗೋಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಫಾರ್ ಟೂ ಮಂತ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸನಾತನ್ ಗೋಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಕೇವ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಇನ್ ಯೋ ಕೂಲ್ ಇಫ್ ಐ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ವೆಲ್ ಅಟ್ ದಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಜಗದಾನಂದ ಪಾಂಡಿತ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಕುಕ್ ಟು ಅ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಕುಕಿಂಗ್ ಸಮ್ ಡೇಸ್ ಸೊ ಸನಾತನ್ ಗೋಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪ್ ಅ ಪೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ರೆಡ್ ಕ್ಲೋತ್ ಸನ್ಯಾಸಿ ಕ್ಲೋತ್ ರಾಪ್ ಅರೌಂಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಹೆಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವೆನ್ ವೆನ್ ಜಗದಾನಂದ ಪಂಡಿತ್ ಸಾವಿ ಹಿ ಥಾಟ್ ದಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಬಿಲಾಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ ರೆಮ್ನಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಮಹಾಪ್ರಭು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ಬಿ ಕೇಮ್ ಫುಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟಸಿ ಇನ್ ಸೀಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ ಅದು ಜಗದಾನಂದ ಪಾಂಡಿತ್ ಸಾವ್ ಇಟ್ ಹಿ ಥಾಟ್ ದಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಸನಾತನ್ ಗೋಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿಂಗ್ ದ ಕ್ಲೋತ್ of Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He was in ecstasy that he had that remnant. But then, but actually the cloth belonged to an old <coughs> sannyasi, Mukunda Sarasvati, who was a, a Vaishnava, he was not even a Vaishnava, and somehow he had given that piece of cloth, and Sanatana Goswami took it and wear it. So Jagadananda Pandit became very upset with him, and actually wanted to beat him with a pot. He took a pot, how do you dare to take the cloth of someone else? You're not taking the pot, uh, the, sorry, the cloth of our master. He wanted to beat him. And then Sanatan Goswami, he humbly apologized and he said, that actually, it must be, this must be an arrangement to show how much love you have for Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And you are right. And then he said, Actually, the Rakta Vastra, the red cloth, is not fit for a Vaishnava. And we see that in the line after Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there are almost no cases of Gaudiya Vaishnava sannyasis wearing the red cloth until Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur reinstituted it. So, the idea What is the message there for us? The idea is that the red cloth may foster in us, and we should be careful about that. Some devotees, very senior Vaishnavas, who were sannyasis for many years, who, had, who went through trouble, in the interviews, I don't say names here, but in the, in the interviews, they reveal one of the elements was pride. So pride can be manifest in many different ways. We're taking it for granted and free from problem. But we have seen, even after 60 years old, that's history, some devotees had trouble. So not just the, the recent late case. In Gaudiya we have the case of Ananta Vasudev, Prabhu, or we call him Maharaj, he had trouble after 60 years old. He was an Aishtika Brahmachari, lifelong. Very learned, much more learned than most of our scholars, if no more. He has a reputation of being super learned that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur will draw from him to quote verses and will tell him, okay, you go. So, So it's something to, to be aware of. One reason for the pride would be the, the red cloth and the whole tradition, which is not coming so much from Vaishnavism, is coming from the Shankara line. This idea, the, Sh the Shankara line, Namo Narayana, that the Sanyasi is, is almost like God. This comes from the Shankara line. 
And then, of course, by some other chariots, take it for preaching. And, and yes, Sakshat Hari Tuena Samasta Shastra, Guru is God's representative and is as good as God. But we should be careful not to mistake, not to become confused that we, as soon as I become Sanyasi, I become Paramahamsa. That's a misunderstanding, which is part of the history of this one. If we look at the Sonavacharya history, I, I think I can speak like that because uh, most of you, you are familiar with that, I think. Or everybody is familiar here, no? shouldn't be. The Sonavacharya days, the idea that one is Sanyasi is Paramahamsa, that's a misconception also. Actually, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta yeah. Sarasvati Thakur, he established the red cloth to show that we are within the Varnashan system. We have to follow rules and regulations because the Babajis, the Babaji class, had misrepresented the Paramahamsa dress of Rupa and Sanatan Goswami. So, so going back to the history, after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there was a system of Vesha initiation, which is the Bhavati initiation. And when you say red cloth, is that distinguished from saffron cloth? It's the same. same. Yeah, red or saffron. Yes. It wasn't until later that Ram Bhakti Siddhanta introduced the saffron. Yes. Yes, red saffron is the same. In India, sometimes red cloth is used. Even in Gaudi Yamaha, if we we'll read some of the, for example, Sri Prabhupada's brother, uh, Sri uh, Bhakti Rachak Sridhar Maharaj, he will refer to it as red cloth. So it's saffron cloth, it's the same. Uh, so, so, so there, there was, during the Vesha initiation period, the Babaji period, uh, san sannyasis will be Babajis, uh, no Brahman thread. I don't know what the Sikh, in the Sikh I think they are, they are keeping, they, they, they were shaving also. They, they will shave? Yeah. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did shave his Sikh also, that's in Chaitanya Bhagavad. Uh -huh. So, uh, but later on, about 150 to 100 years ago, the Babaji system of uh, initiation and practices became very degraded to the point that Babajis and Matajis, who will be, will be also taking this initiation, they will even have children and, and they had the Jati Goshai class is coming from such uh, irreligious mixture and very degraded actually. So, so uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur and prior to him Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, they identified many groups of Sahajyas and these Babajis will be classified in these groups. So where does that fit in our society? These four stages. How does it how does it relate to us as an institution? I mean, I, I will say that here I'm giving just an opinion. I, I will say that we shouldn't, Paramahamsa shouldn't be a rubber stamp. As Srila Prabhupada expressed in some occasions, should be self effulgent, shouldn't be by rubber stamping because we have been very embarrassed by rubber stamping Paramahamsas. Um, and even age is not a criteria. I, I will say, 
something we can learn from the Roman Catholic Church, keeping the different, the big differences, is that they don't they don't represent like the fully saints, like in equivalent the Paramahamsas, until they 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 pass away in grace, like they pass away in divine grace. Then, okay, the disciples may consider their guru as as Paramahamsa. That's up to the disciples. But institutionally, we, it's a big mistake to do that because it's can, can be very embarrassing actually. For the for the purpose of Sanyas, which is preaching, it's very embarrassing. So then we go to Gaudiya Math. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, in 1918, founders, founds the Gaudiya Math in Gora Purnima Day. In the, in, the, in the same day, he takes Sanyas initiation from a picture of Srila Gaura Kishora, that's Babaji Maharaj. And he, he, uh, he substantiates that initiation because Ramana Acharya did it. So he does it. We could say why he didn't take from the Ramana and Yasis in South India. One reason would be that the Ramana and Yasis will give sanyas only to those poor in Brahmana families, which Srila Bhaktisiddhanta was not. That could be an explanation. Another explanation would be, don't bother, like some of his disciples said, he didn't find anybody qualified in the in Vrindavan, in the area, so therefore he took from a picture of his guru. As we have this, the incident in Navadweep when during the Tiroba celebration of Srila Gora Kishora Das Babaji, that the unqualified Babajis wanted to give Samadhi to Srila Gora Kishora Das Babaji, but they were not properly following. So that could be another reason why he took from a picture. That shouldn't be imitated when there are Vaishnava Sanyasis. We had in this also in the history some imitations that the Sanyas ministry had to intervene, isn't it? We had some. Baba gave Babaji initiation to Wonder Boy in 1975 in Chicago. And then eventually he gave it to him because the man had terminal disease also. He thought he did. And then, of course, after when he realized he didn't have eternal disease, he gave up. Baba told him, go to my floor and chant 64 rounds a day and just, you know, stay in one place and perform, you know, your bhajan. But then after that incident showed that this person kind of destroyed that whole idea, then Baba never did that again. So that incident, this does show that I was considering that as part of our institutions to give that. But then he saw that he was misused or abused. Just like when he was marrying the devotees for a while and gave that up because how they were taking that cheap uh, According to His Holiness Bhakti Vikash Maharaj uh, biography of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta gave. 13 Babaji initiations, but those initiations will be to devotees who will be very good in bhajan, but will not be fit for preaching. Fit or, but their nature, so he gave them Babaji initiation, 13. And Shri Bhakti Siddhanta initiated uh, tw 20 about, around 20 sannyasis himself. Of course, later on in the line, many more were initiated. There is even one controversial case which shows also how Srila Bhaktisiddhanta's priority was on preaching. There is one controversial case is, you, you may have heard about that case where the wife came and took the sannyasi disciple, took him back home. That case, later on, he 
Actually, for some time, according to Bhakti Vikash Maharaj's book, he had become kind of involved with Christian people and so on. But later on, he gave him sannyas again, and he gave him as a preacher. I forgot his name. So it seems that Srila Bhaktisiddhanta, Saraswati Thakur, and even Srila Prabhupada, they gave priority to save the disciple and to preach over the external considerations. Of course, we have to wait also how far we can go. We cannot imitate them. And as we will see from historical analysis, since the Sanyas ministry is doing the screening process, which started uh, even before the Sanyas ministry was founded, started in 1975, very, very shortly, with one year waiting list, since the follow screening process has developed, the, the rate of sannyas giving up has diminished dramatically. That's, that's there. So, so that's very healthy, that the screening process. But yet we shouldn't take it for granted because we can make a statistics only after 20, 30 years when, when the sannyasis, they have given up their body in grace. Yeah, that's, that's we, we shouldn't think, okay, I made it, until we are, we are done. It's like that. Don't, we shouldn't take it for granted. In ISKCON we have at least at least two or more sannyasis who went through difficulty after 60. And a number after 50. And after 40, quite a number. So, so therefore, it means we should take precautions. Uh, and Srila Bhaktisiddhanta said, okay, four, four, four points about uh, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta is establishing sannyas to summarize. He did it in order to preach pure bhakti, and it's interesting that he he copied the model of modern Mayavadis, like the Ramakrishna mission. Neo Vedantis are called by scholars. So he copied their model of sannyas and did it in a Vaishnava fashion for preaching because he saw they were, they were very successful in promoting their philosophy. So let's use the same model and the Ramakrishna mission, but do it to spread the message of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Then he also wanted to, to establish Thai Varna Ashram and rules for establish the Sanyasi as the leader of society, spiritual leader of society. Also, he wanted to uphold the sacred status of the Paramahamsa dress, Babaji dress, so that we don't imitate Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, Haridas Thakur, and disgrace their, uh, their example by misbehaving. Of course, the same will apply to the Sanyas dress. So we should be it's a great responsibility when we take a dress not to disgrace what has been given to us. Even though Srila Prabhupada very mercifully in a historical period of the movement, in order to save disciples, he said, okay, if you cannot make it, okay, then become the and you can do it. But that should be, okay, that's part of the history. Yeah. Yeah, we shouldn't, we shouldn't know, we should come to the point where like that the sannyasi gives up should be something very, very, very rare. And especially if we are taking sannyas as older men, should be very, very exceptional. One thing, when I travel around to different places, I see so many devotees usually wearing white and they don't keep the tail, they wear like uh, Babaji style. And uh, I 
see it so much is that they have now accepted in this gun, or should I try to correct that in a tactful way? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what they, why they do that. You have to ask them why they do that. I, I tried to correct it, but they always do that. No. Why do they do it? Is it just they feel they're very senior or something? Either that or they just don't like that style of dress, the other one. That's the thing. It's just that other person. Yeah, it's just like, it's kind of like a little uncomfortable. It feels like they don't want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> Establish a movement 
you, you must take sannyas. And then he saw Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati as he had called him in three dreams three times during his life, beckoning, come, join me, take sannyas, preach. And then Srila Prabhupada accepted sannyas. And he came to the West as a Vaishnava sannyasi, preaching. And he showed his accommodating nature when he went, for example, in Butler, Pennsylvania, when he was keeping, in order for preaching, he was uh, bypassing many of the rules normally. The a sannyasi would say, come on, this is not proper for a sannyasi. But for preaching, he was doing. Like he was keeping the vegetables in the same fridge where they were keeping unmentionable things. And he would do it for preaching. They will smoke, and when people will say, oh, sorry, Swami, he will say, think nothing of it. Very kindly, he was extending himself to give them Krishna consciousness. Of course, later on, he educated disciples to exhibit proper behavior. So sometimes in our preaching, we also extend ourselves, but we should be careful how far we extend ourselves so that we don't become affected by uh, improper association. As history has shown, we cannot imitate his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. I think that's, one of, that's a very important point. Uh, I think maybe the loosening up of one's mental faculties in terms of one's austerities of practice comes by way of trying to imitate Prabhupada. And that's a good example. You're out preaching alone. You need some support, and you can't take too many risks. Ultimately, you, and that's where you get attracted. You can't fall down. You fall down in the mind anyway, and then from there that could lead to something. I mean, I'm just thinking in my own situation. I was one situation that didn't allow me any support, any association anything. But somehow that Krishna just destroyed that opportunity for me to preach like that. And I was so glad it happened. It was a new area with I'm not knowing anyone. I was supposed to stay at a house of uh, people who I never met before. And there was a lady there who was not in the house. And, you know, and then somehow or other it got changed by Krishna's arrangement. But I was thinking if I were into that situation, I would I would be really struggling to do my service. So now I look back and I, I'm, I was, I'm happy that that didn't happen. But we can't make a mistake and take unnecessary risks. Many of the, in the interviews of two sannyasis and ex sannyasis, one of the factors that came up for giving up was loneliness and going to preach to places alone, yeah. to new places. Well, as a rule of thumb, we should always have association. If we are alone, should be only on the plane to the next place. That should be a rule of thumb, of thumb for sannyasis. It's, it's much more healthy, it's avoiding taking unnecessary risk. Because when, when, the, when there is loneliness or, or asso association of people who are not devotees, and not about the association, there is a chance to do something improper, and it may not come in immediately, but gradually can filter until one is stuck in something one doesn't want to, to be involved. Uh, going to Srila Prabhupada's giving sannyas for preaching, uh, in 1972, Two, two sannyasis asked him during the sannyasi initiation, Rudayananda Maharaj and Chaturum Maharaj, asked him what were the restrictions 
for in Sanyas life in compared to other ashrams. And Sri Prabhupada said, well, this is from Satsangu Maharaja's diary. He says, he said, he's com he compiled that in 1972. Prabhupada said, there were two restrictions in Sanyas life. One is that when meeting a rich man and seeing his opulent wealth, we must not think, oh, I have given up everything, but I wish I could enjoy these things. And the other restriction is that when we see a beautiful woman, we must not think, I had a beautiful wife and now this beautiful woman. If I could enjoy her, in other words, do not have any regrets about taking sannyas. Aside from these two restrictions, there are no others compared to other ISKCON members. And then Prabhupada ended saying, no go and preach. So it's about going and preach with people and speak about Krishna. Uh, okay, to end, it's almost time. I wanted to have more time for discussion, but it's a very broad topic and difficult to cover in one session. Uh, some relevant, relevant data about ISKCON, which I have not mentioned. Uh, okay. In the history of ISKCON, there is the controversy between Sanyasis and Grihastas in the mid-70s, which in some way extended throughout the history until the end of the 80s, we could say. The idea of immature renunciation, where there was mistreatment of Grihasta Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. So that's something to be, I think we are aware, but it's something to be mentioned in the history. Um, actually, Srila Prabhupada had to intervene when uh, some of the senior leaders were asking Srila Prabhupada to ask the Grihastas and the, and the ladies to, that they will live outside the temples and only Brahmacharis and Sanyasis will live in the temples. Srila Prabhupada did, did not accept that and sent the main preacher to preach in, in China, which was very successful, was for, for, for a good purpose. But the, the point is that Srila Prabhupada uh, did not accept that, uh, that stand of putting aside or down Grihastas and women, something to be aware of for us as sannyasis. Uh, okay, I think all the other points were mentioned. Uh, certainly, there have been a gradual, a gradual screening of new sannyasis, a process which started in 1975 with one year waiting list. There was in 1980, uh, 1981, there was a two-year moratorium by the. Uh, okay. Whatever the year it is, it's at the end 70s, beginning of 80s, two years, uh, the, the two-year two moratorium, no new sannyasis because many had given up. But then it is, what it shows is the predicament of the GBC body at the time. Uh, there was a predicament that, okay, we need sannyasis for preaching, but yet we don't want sannyasis to fall down. Because what happened is that after that moratorium, there were on the waiting list there were like 20, 25 devotees from which there was a mega 
I think 24, 25 according to GBC resolutions were approved for sannyas. So which indicates there is a need for sannyasis, but we don't want them to give up. Mm -hmm. It's quite it's more of a history behind that. The because uh, at that time you had the beginning of the zone of Sharia controversy also, whether or not, you know, what the position of the zone of Sharia was. And you had Sridhar Maharaj, who had fallen out of his favor, who was uh, initiating sannyas, his kind of devotees, the sannyasis, whoever went to him practically, cut sannyas. So at that time they realized that if we want to keep anyone left in our society, we better start giving sannyas. <laughs> So that's when I had my meeting in 82. Okay, so okay good, good point. Or one point to be added to the, to the history. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, we saw that many of them didn't maintain sannyas. And this brings us to uh, the, the, the 10 factors from the interviews came up 10 factors why devotees succeed if they apply them positively or fail in maintaining sannyas. One of them was immature motivations. The immature motivation is, if the motivation is I'm going to get more respect, I want to take sannyas because, okay, now I'm in the big chair, then that's not, that's not sustainable. That actually will jeopardize. We find that in Jai Madharma, there is a, a case where one of the, of the well, they were Babajis in that time, but they were sannyasis in that way, approaches one of the senior preachers, and then he, he tells he's having impure thoughts, which of course for a sannyasi is, is, a, a, is a mental fall down. So he's having impure, impure thoughts. And then the cause for that is identified by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur in the, in the narrative, that it was due to having taken sannyas to early for prestige and then these impurities came up to, to him. The way to get rid of those impurities is by constant association of advanced Vaishnavas. So, so that's one of the elements. Uh, I could read quickly the list, we'll not, there will not be time for discussion, but I went with this, read the list and the positive sides of it, and then, I don't know, I don't think we have much time, it's time to stop. Which list is that? This is a list based on the interviews I made to sannyasis and ex sannyasis of factors which contribute to fall down, looking in the, in the, if we want to prevent, and we can look at the positive side of it, I'll read other 10 in the positive side of it. Choose some of the more outstanding ones. No, just read the list. Uh, yeah, just read the list. Yeah. First, immature motivations for becoming a sannyasi. Second, ordination while young, taking sannyas too early. Three, difficult personal relationships. When there are difficult personal relationships, the sannyasi cannot, if he's going through a difficult period, doesn't have someone in whom to confide and to approach for help, then it's a problem. Loneliness and insufficient spiritual support. So even sannyasi should have peers or senior, senior sannyasis who mentor them and help them, help us. Lack of experience, role models, well-defined rules of conduct, and well-established social system. The only role model was His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, and then because of a lack of role models at other level, it was difficult to not to imitate Prabhupada, and this brought trouble. Six, classical temptations, that's sex, wealth, and fame. Seven, 
pride and offenses. Eight, this is very important, even now, even though we have the screening process, the, the, the Sanyas list, but going back to the 60-year-old phenomenon we experience, this is what is called midlife or mature age crisis, which, which the, there may be fi final temptations which may come at a mature age when the senses and the mind rebel, do it now or you will not be able to do it. So that could become manifest. It seems that there is something psychophysical and, and also from the process of purification that sometimes manifests and it has happened. Nine, excessive self-confidence and lack of preventative means, such as not going to place places where there are no devotees to preach alone. That's a killer. Avoid that at all costs. I went recently to Cabo Verde. I go with a team, three, four devotees, at least one devotee, no alone, to new places. And finally, of course, lack of experiencing a higher taste. Higher taste will give us the strength to not be affected by any test that will become, will appear. These are all causes of fall down. Yes. Lack of higher taste, did anyone mention anything about lack of proper sudden? Yes, that will be in, that's there, it's in the higher taste, the southern. I, I integrated it there, but it's, yes, we should emphasize it, it cannot be overemphasized. Yeah. All right. You can put it as a distinctive characteristic. All right. Okay, the one before that. The, the nine was excessive self-confidence self-confidence, and a lack of preventative means, meaning taking precaution, thinking I'm okay, I can't go anywhere, I can't do anything, no problem. And then we get into trouble for not being cautious. And, and then... Well, there's another phenomenon that's, you know, that's included in there. When you had some of our sannyasis become initiated gurus and they thought they had become paramahamsas, there seemed to have been a lack of philosophical understanding of actually what their position was. And that led them to become <coughs> more susceptible to outside influence. <coughs> so yeah, they thought they were paramahamsas and they could do whatever they wanted to do and everything would be all right. Yeah, and, and, in, and the reason, it, the, the culture we experience in ISKCON, it's a culture of that as soon as you are sannyasi, people treat you as, as if you are Paramahamsa. And that's that, something to be careful about because you may end it, as one ex sannyasi told me, you shouldn't believe her. But people come telling you, they may not say it verbally, no, but in the behavior, in the, what is offered, it's part of the Indian culture also, especially in India. It's part of the culture. And then either you, you may get into trouble or you get into physical trouble because they want you to eat everything and then you cannot digest even the food physically and you get ill. Acidity, I never got acidity before. I'm starting to get acidity. <laughs> something to be careful about. Even if only for physical health in order to be able to properly preach. And, okay, the list is in positive also. I'll repeat it just for emphasis, very quickly. In positive, to consider oneself always a servant of the servant and never a master. The title Swami is to be used only to preach and to serve. Two, do not take sannyas too early, whatever that means to you. 
Three, engage always body, mind, and words in Krishna's service. Four, develop strong friendships with devotees and especially develop profound friendships with other sannyasis because a tendency is to become isolated. Sannyasi with a group of disciples, but, but no, it's necessary. Strong friendships. Five, avoid loneliness and isolation. Six, do not go to preach alone. Seven. Avoid loneliness and isolation. Can you explain that? Sometimes they say in, in pastoral care, this is in Christian circles, but it's very much applicable to us also. They use a term, they say, alone at the top. So this is some, something people who take care of the spiritual lives of others. If doesn't have a support system, God brothers or other, other, other devotees who will give support, can feel very lonely. And this can be a danger for, for a sannyasi. Yeah, if I could just make one observation that we find that very often as spiritual leaders, they are surrounded by what you say, yes men. In other words, everything is very, very nice, and no one will say a discouraging word or even a well intentioned criticism. It says your critics are your best friends. So I would suggest that we should qualify when you said make friendship, especially with sannyasis. That doesn't mean we form a mutual admiration society and that we all so-called support one another by just whitewashing or minimizing the problems that we may see in one another. Not to find fault, but at the same time to be the best friend of one another by, and we should be able to listen to our peers and even our subordinates if they could point out that we're off in some way, we take it very seriously. Yes, yes, Pro the friendship should be profound, yes. <coughs> uh, yeah. I think, um, even in the Sunday Amsterdam, one once you have a senior, somewhere you can go to and say, you know, I got this problem, I have this consideration, or, or someone to say, is there something in me that you can tell me about that I can improve? We get in the idea that sannyasi means complete freedom and there's no nobody above us. And that's dangerous. I think it's very dangerous unless unless you're a pure soul. But even then, you can see. So your point is well taken. Yeah. But I, as you mentioned earlier, once you have someone you can go to. I find that necessary just to get back on. If you start seeing certain things in yourself you don't like, or the way you're acting, or the situation causes you to respond in a way that is not conducive to your, you know, proper consciousness, or whatever, you might say, well, well, how do I deal with that? And then you go to someone and get some clarification. I think you need that. And the final four points, avoid accumulating too much disciples, positions, etc. That's too much, that's up to everyone to decide, but that's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's order, so that's there. Eight, spend time regularly in good Sangha to develop spiritual strength in order to give what must be taken. Otherwise, it's very difficult to be able to, to give. Nine, do not take success for granted and be attentive to possible crises. Don't be surprised if something happens, then we should be, okay, this may be coming. A storm is coming, how do I deal with it? I do expect that it may come. Then I'm ready to, to fight it or to tolerate or to approach it. Take shelter like that. <clears throat> and finally, experience Krishna's higher taste through bhajan, sadhana, and preaching Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> Going back, 
to this idea of loneliness? What did you say on that? What was your understanding of that principle? Well, well, many, many devotees, some of the ex and yasis, they told me that they had trouble in feeling alone. Right? And being what, what about the principle of fearlessness? One should be alone and know that they're not alone. <coughs> Yes, that's, that's there, that's the Abhayam principle, but if we see it in the experience that many of us, of our peers, seniors, they were alone and they were hurt, better go with somebody and be protected, I, I would say, I mean, this is what... Yeah, I mean, we should be fearless. Fearless for material things. If you put it in circumstances, that's one thing, but if you try to act fearless when you're not, then that's something different. If you're in a circumstance and you have to understand, well, I'm not alone, Krishna's always with me. My spiritual master's instructions are always with me. Yeah, of course, I mean, if we're there, yes. If Krishna puts us in, us in a circumstance, then. But, but if we put ourselves, that's, that's what they meant. No, that's different. Uh, yeah. Well, at this point of notice, I understand it in a different way. Not that you fear that I'm not being protected or something like that. It's the lack of a personal, loving relationship.